Thanks to Colonial Brewing Co. for sponsoring the pod today. Thank you, Colonial. For those of you who may not know, it's pros and cons time. <laughs> Mr. Smith? Hey, who's that? David Zakopaka Rockus. Wrong. How yeah, the bloody hell do you say that? Zaka Pros and cons. What is going on, everybody? Hello, Daniel. We're back. We're back. Three week hiatus. Yes, just randomly just disappeared off the face of the earth. Yes. We are back. Thanks for everyone for their patience. Yes, there was a reason why. Yeah, unfortunately. How you feeling, mate? Uh, yeah, going okay. The ankle is uh, is all right. I had so I had surgery. Um, if we're going to talk about it, I had surgery. Uh, what would have been three or four days after that Frio game that I did a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, that yeah, sorry, the Tuesday, and uh, I've been. Recuperating, or what is it, what's the word? Recovering. Recuperating. Recuperating, yeah. Recovering. Recovering, all that resting. at home. Resting. Rice. Yeah, rice. Yeah, <laughs> rice is now. I think it's like- What is it? They just keep adding letters onto it now. <laughs> what is the e- know. What is ERS at the what end? What is it? Uh, rest, ice. Isn't it- I don't know. I, I, I'm not a I'm doctor. I'm a like that. I don't even know what it is. Rest, <laughs> ice, compress. Compress. Elevate. Elevate. And then there was two other- R. S at the end as well. Now. RS. Yeah, there's two others. Just Actually, another even know rest are, again. Yeah, I've, I've seen a sign for rices. But yeah, I've been doing all that, mate. So that's been a uh, shocking two weeks, shit ass two weeks. Some doctors, some physios just losing um, their mind listening to this right now. Yeah, I know. Because have exactly. no idea what you're talking no. about. No, but I had, I had the surgery. Um, uh, yeah, Oppie, Andrew Oppie uh, in Melbourne, who does a lot of the AFL guys, lower, lower leg injuries, and had that done. Uh, I was in, I was. <laughs> So it's, I had a, a doctor's appointment with him at oh, 11 o'clock on uh, a pre-surgery meeting at 11 o'clock that day. And there was a couple other guys getting done. We had Noah Gown and, and Irving Mosquito getting surgeries as well on that day. And we were all in, all in there. And uh, I was the first one um, uh, first one for that day. So we had a meeting at 11.30 or whatever with him. Uh, and then he said, all right, go downstairs. You'll be sort of prepped and ready for surgery. Um, he goes, you'll be home by four o'clock i was like what do you mean mate like it's 11 30 now i'll be home by four and he was like yep no nah, short surgery it's 15 minutes non-invasive whatever and i was yeah. like yeah right like it must, it must not be too bad and i went in there by one o'clock i was in the uh room so talking to the anesthesiologist or whatever they are and uh, anesthesia i can't even say that word <laughs> Wait, you have, where you have the anesthetic yeah, yeah. so whatever the, the name anesthesiologist. is anesthesiologist yeah that one yeah, yeah. Um, so I was in there uh, talking to her. It was about, I reckon, I remember being about one fifteen, And then I remember just talking to her and she's like, all right, this will be a bit of a sting. Went straight under. I would have literally woke up three o'clock. So an hour and a half later, that's how quick it was. An hour and a half, back in the room. And it was done. And then uh, and then I remember the, the nurse saying, all right, you're going home. I was like, what do you mean I'm going home? I've just woken up. I feel cruel, guys. Yeah. I feel sick. But they're like, no, your housemate's waiting outside. Um, Tommy's there. You're ready to go. And I was like, just I, just, I just wanted to sleep there. Like, just let me sleep. Let me recover and that. But like, no, nah, you're fine to go. And I was fine, but I was just more tired and stuff like that. Just wanted to rest. And then I remember it being in Oppie saying it's non-invasive. Like, it's pretty, pretty quick, pretty 15 minutes. I woke up with that much pain and just numbness in your leg. Like, and you just, you can't move post-surgery. It doesn't matter that it's 15 minutes or that it's a two-hour surgery. Was it keyhole surgery? They like go in like one little thing. Yeah. So I had to get, so on the surgery, I had to get, um, so my surgery syndesmosis is where the bones separate uh, down near your ankle, your tibia and fibula. Um, they separate and then come back together. And if they come back together at a hard, a sort of a hard, quick pace, it can um, chip bone off and all that. So luckily I wasn't that where uh, mine just sort of separated the ligaments in between the bones and the bones sort of separated and came back together. And so I had that, what they do is they get put a tight rope. They, for anyone who doesn't like squirmish things, maybe tune off at 10 or 15 seconds. So what they do is they drill a hole through your two bones and they put a tight rope through there and then they um, put two pins on either side. It's kind of like craft work. Like a, a trader would be listening to this guy. That's what we work. And then they put two pins on, pull, um, screw the pins, so it pulls the rope tight, which pulls the bones in together. And then they just that sets then for now the next couple of weeks and months and the ligaments in between get to heal. So um, I had to get that, but also they discovered they had a couple of bone spurs in my foot uh, from previous injuries. Um, or previous rolled ankles or whatever you happen, you play sport for 15 years, that things are going to happen. So they um, they thought we may as well shave those off 
because uh, they would allow my ankle to be a bit more, bit more free because I've sort of been feeling pain over the last couple of years just there on and off. And the reason why was because there was a, sort of a little hook on the end of my tibia bone going into my ankle bone every time I ran. And it was just sort of chipping away, chipping away, that kind of ah. thing. So, yeah, it's kind of it acted like a little hook on um, the little bone spur that grew there. So we got that shaved down uh, and that sort of added to maybe a bit of the recovery time. Uh, and that's probably why at the moment my ankle was a bit sore at the front, where of that exposed bone they've shaved off. So um, all in all, going pretty well. I was in a moon boot and crutches for a week. And then I was- That's super short, like from what I think. That's, that doesn't say, like you're not in anything right now. Yeah, yeah it's been three weeks now and yeah, I'm just walking around. Uh, so That's originally awesome. it was about two weeks in the moon boot uh, and about 10 days after. Um, so pretty much after the party that we went to together, yes. um, pretty much the day after that, I woke up and just thought, oh geez, I reckon I can walk around on it. Um, and that was 10 days post. And uh, he was fine with it though. He said, as long as you can move without, um, one, without crutches and walk in the moon boot. And then two, if you feel like you can come out of the moon boot whenever you can, it's not like a set time because normally about two to three weeks. So mine was about 10 days, started walking on it. Um, and then, yeah, I've been sort of walking on it last now 10 days. So it's been three weeks since the surgery and recovery is going well. The calf's gone though. The calf's completely <laughs> gone. <laughs> Trying to build that back up. And now it's all about rehab and recovery. We've obviously got about 10 weeks now till pre-season starts but it's all about sort of the first three or four weeks for me still going in getting physio treatment and getting it right so you would have um obviously now it doesn't make a difference because unfortunately the boys lost on the weekend um but if they didn't and best case scenario they've played like what was the best case scenario for you yeah the best case scenario was we were, we were trying to get back for a granny uh but that still would have broken records in terms of the syndesmosis right. and the bone spur injury coming back uh, so there was always hope, uh, but now it's pretty much I won't be full training or in a full training program till probably end of November. Start, uh, sorry, end of October, start of November. So it still is like an eight week injury, uh, and even even probably going back into pre season, we start the twenty fifth. I might not be in full contact, change of direction, noise. So. You can imagine how long the injury process was, but we were trying to short track it to uh, yeah. or fast track it to a four or five week. Hopeful. Yeah, hopeful. Yeah. But now we can actually just get it right, let it settle um, and then have no injury concerns going into next year. When it happened, did you know straight away? Uh, no, I actually thought it was... So the motion, people are watching the game, they got caught under me and it was sort of in that um, calf raise sort of motion where all your back... My, I thought my Achilles and my calf were going to snap in that instant. Like that's... So... And obviously the incident lasts for a second, but in that moment you feel like it lasts for five or 10 seconds where as I was going down, I could feel everything stretch at the back and I thought my Achilles could tear here. And I was just like wanting to that to hold on. And in the end, when I went down, the immediate pain I felt in my ankle, I didn't realize it was the syndesmosis injury, but I just sort of felt the back of my heel, the back of my ankle and that, I just felt pain. So I didn't really know what I was grabbing at the time, but I remember running, oh, not running, I've got carried off. And then we were trying to run on the sideline um, post that because we didn't really know what it was. I sort of thought oh, I'm feeling pain here, feeling pain there. Yeah, like yeah, it could be this, could be that. Um, and then so I tried to run, and all my pain was at the front. And as soon as I said all my pain was at the front, they're like, yeah, it could be that that type of injury um, that I had. Uh, and then I remember I had an old physio at the footy club text me, and he he uh, he goes, oh, what what kind of injury do you have? And I said, oh, I've got a grade two syndesmosis. And he couldn't believe it. He goes, what the fuck? He goes, and they were fucking trying to make you run like up and down the ground on the boundary line. And you got this grade two. And I was like, yeah, I, I could run. I could actually feel like I could run. Um, but I like once I, so I did one run through and I thought I'm actually all right. And then I did the second run through and the pain was just enormous through the front. And that's why people maybe on TV kept seeing me trying to run up and down a couple of times. Cause it actually felt when you sort of took three or four minutes off, it felt all right. And then the second run, it was shocking. Um, he was like, I can't believe you were even running on there with the, with that injury. So don't know how, but we were actually almost contemplating going back out there. But then, yeah. Did they take you down, give you a jab or anything? Did it get to, didn't even get to that point? No, they, they did take me back down and, and we took the tape off and they thought about retaping it. But then that was the stage after I did those couple of run throughs. And there wasn't, I don't think it, they could jab it anyway because it was right in the middle of the ankle. Pretty much. I couldn't tell them where the pain was and yeah. it felt like it was right in the middle of the ankle bone and the doctor was like no no we can't jab that and we're not going to so that was fine i didn't ask for it they, they sort of more just took me through the process of that that if you were wanting to wanting it we're not going to do it and that was fine anyway because like, like i said once i did two probably two run-throughs i just knew that 
there was something wrong with the front of the ankle uh, and it was giving me too much pain. So I couldn't change direction, which is pretty much what you can't do in this. Well, that's the last thing you rehab when you rehab. That's the last thing you do, change direction. So I knew I couldn't do that and there was something seriously wrong. But there's always hope that it's not syndesmosis, but yeah. in the end it was. So now just recovery, like the season's over, unfortunately. So what's what's happened from here? Have you guys had your last, your final meetings and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so I had it. Um, uh, I had it before the game, uh, before the last uh, last final, which which they do with a couple of guys. That's not uncommon to do that. Guys that have um, injuries, um, it's not uncommon to do that. So I had mine then. Um, had the interview, and then I've still got my <clears throat> I've still got my medical today, um, which is Tuesday. I've got my, my final medical today, which is kind of just. Um, uh, it's, I wouldn't say tick boxing, but it's more like I'm going to be in there the next three weeks anyway. So we're doing my medical, just the, the official end of season medical, but I'm still seeing the physio. It's not like I'm now leaving and, and going away for the next two months and not seeing the physios. It's just um, go through your whole body, uh, your medical history, all that kind of thing. And then it's, uh, it's I'll still be in there for the next three, four weeks, probably getting physio treatment um, and doing my rehab on it. And Mad Mondays, that happened? Uh, it hasn't because our VFL is still in. So they had a great win of, over Werribee on the weekend. A uh, couple of points. I was a bit nervous here in the last quarter because, I mean, that should have been a prelim anyway. They were about 40 points against Richmond mm. the week before and had a disappointing last quarter, but they uh, they won on the weekend. So we're pushing it back. We obviously a full club thing, the, uh, our Mad Monday or Wacky Wednesday or whenever it is post uh, interviews or ex- exit meetings. So we'll have uh, we'll have that once they, they finish up because we like to have everyone there. So we don't just have our AFL, we have all our VFL guys there as well because we're obviously Essendon, VFL and AFL. So... Um, we'll do that when they finish. So they're in a prelim this Sunday. Uh, who are they against? Against um, Willie, I think they are maybe. Mm. Uh, so yeah, they'll they'll play that, and then yeah, if they make the granny, they make the granny. If if uh, if not, it'll be Wacky Wednesday next week. Uh, yeah. what, what's it? Cha- what's changed since uh, since you started in terms of Mad Monday Wacky Wednesday? Oh, that sounds uh, terrible. Wacky Wednesday. You came up with that one. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. What's changed since when you've started to now when the even season that ends? Um. Oh. I don't know. You, could, you can argue they're less tame, but that's. But then, no, if you get it, you get in a room, then no one, there's no windows or anything. That doesn't be that. Well, it's not that tame. I feel like that. It's from what we see. It's a lot. They like kind of let some of the press in at the start. In some, some clubs, and in Geelong, always mm, do that. And smart. Then, and then uh, it's closed doors. Yeah. Whereas I don't know if it, maybe when you started, it might not have been as closed doors. It was kind of just go out and do what you got to do. Yeah. Well, I remember oh, our second or third, my third year, we were at the Rising Sun in Richmond, which was. A bad one. Um, that was that was yeah, still open to the public kind of thing. And yeah, it was it was bad. It was uh, yeah, you had to go behind closed doors or go in a pub that we shut off for the day or or yeah, yeah somewhere wherever it is, wherever it may be. But it's got to be shut off from the public because yeah, it does get quite wild. And um, uh, yeah, as long as long as it's like that, where you're right, I think Geelong yeah, Geelong do a while where they they bring the media in, they all get in their costumes and the media can sort of interview a couple of them, and then it's like all right, see you later. You've got your content for the day and. Um, that's it, and then they close it off. So that's a that's a good way to do it. Are you allowed to drink now that you're injured? Uh, yeah, well, like, um, well, it's not a soft tissue injury, um, but obviously alcohol doesn't help the recovery process. So, um, but I think yeah, obviously um, I'm three weeks post surgery now, back into my rehab. That I'm um, I'm not a big drinker anyway, but um, maybe Mad Monday you'll, or whatever it is, Wacky Wednesday, you'll have a drink with the boys. But that's a, that's probably about it. I haven't haven't. Um, touched it. I didn't go out on the weekend. So when the boys lost, uh, what was it? Thursday night, they came back Friday. I didn't go out Friday, Saturday because I'd had something else with my heel in the same foot that I was recovering from. So um, I didn't go out or anything like that. So that's um, just been trying to help the recovery process there. Awesome. Uh, we have uh, awesome guests coming up. Uh, Lillian Dickmans, who's yes. uh, a Muay Thai fighter and a model and uh, a lawyer. Um, She's covered a lot of areas. <laughs> she? A few yeah. things to do <laughs> in life. Um, before we get into that, let's get into the pros and cons of the week. I've got some big cons. I think you have a really good pro. Yes, very good pro coming up. It's pros and cons time. <laughs> All right, let's let's hear your pro, mate, because I'm gonna go hard on my con. My pro, mate, is NFL season is back. Yes, NFL 100 too. NFL 100. Year, oh, yes. This is this we, we had we walked in today and we had both had the same pro, so we've decided to just go one pro, one con to amalgamate our pros. Yes, yep. and the Packers won. Yeah. Go <laughs> the Packers. Giants lost. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, 
Yeah, I'm a big Giants fan. I reckon it's going to be a long, long season. Yep. So it's one of my. It's not a con officially, but it's a con. Now, did you see this Antonio Brown stuff that happened? Have you been watching Hard Knocks? Yeah. Oh well, no, I haven't. I haven't you watched haven't any watched of Hard, Hard Knocks, Knocks. But I do. I what I heard was that they hadn't covered any of this nah, in Hard Knocks. They, they didn't, didn't really. I think it sounds like the Raiders closed doors on on any of this talk because they you know didn't want any of that coming out. Well, all Hard Knocks showed was like a good side to Antonio Brown. So it showed him on the sideline having fun with teammates in the Arizona game, um, showed him training, working hard at, at, at the facility, um, that kind of thing. So it showed the, the major headlines like the frostbite and the feet and all that, but it didn't actually really show, yeah, the, the drama, all yeah. the drama. It, yeah, they kind of skimmed over it. But for those, uh, for those yeah. who don't know about it, he didn't rock up. Well, I mean, you, you could talk about it for an hour. Like, if you want to summarize it, it's a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the most recent stuff is he didn't rock up to an event that he had to be at, a, a play as a thing that he had to co- go to. And then he got fined by the by, by the Raiders. Well, he didn't rock up to a couple of training sessions too. And right. Then, yeah. And then obviously a few things happened with the coach. He had an argument with the coach on the field, all that. And then he, well, supposedly it was all sweet. He came back to the team, apologized to the team. All that. Um, apologise to Mike Maycock, who we had a flu with. Um, I think the thing on Sports Center, wherever I watched, there was that he got up in front of the group and apologised with Derek, uh, Derek Carr. And then all of a sudden, so he thought it was sweet. And then the next day they went, well, here you go. Here's your fines for yeah. missing training and all that. And he's gone, well, no, fuck that. Like, you've given me fines. Like, for that when I, I thought everything was sweet, man. You yeah. just turn around and go, nah. So that. he posted the fine yeah. and the letter from the owner. <laughs> he posted it on Twitter. Oh, no. <laughs> well, how, how Gene, so, and it depends which side of the fence you sit on, viewers or listeners, that he's either a marketing genius and he's done all this for the last month, 100%. or he is the biggest diva you've ever seen in the NFL. Yes. So, whichever way you want to take it, that's up to you. I but, take it yeah. that he's had this planned because did you see the reaction video? The phone and the phone. Did you see the phone call? I didn't see video? the phone call, but I just saw the. Oh, oh. It might, was it the same one? It might have been the same video, but I just saw that when he got announced that he was going to the Pats. So basically, for those people who don't know, they they uh, mm-hmm. the Raiders released him and said, "No, that's it, mate. You're yeah. out." And then the next day, or well, the same day, the Pats signed him fifteen million dollar contract for one year. It's ridiculous. The pa- at the Patriots, yep. who are looking bloody good. Like are you, you're happy to go there and he's run around his whole backyard oh, screaming celebrate. and yelling, celebrating. I think he is a genius. So I've listened to a couple of podcasts this morning and sports center. And so he's got a film guy, right? A videographer. And they were filming that day and they were filming and they were, he was making a film about Antonio Brown. Right. So maybe this is part of it that they already knew. So John Gruden's called him, right? And had that, so you haven't seen it. So John Gruden calls him. Um, he's like, what's going on, Antonio? All that kind of thing. And he's uh, he says a few things. And then um, he's like, uh, he pretty much goes, what, what the hell's going on? Because there's a helmet gate, all this kind of stuff. And then he goes, do you want to be a Raider? And he's like, man, I've been wanting to be a Raider since day one, all that kind of thing. And he's like, do you, do you want me to be a, a Raider and that? And John just goes like, mate, just play some football. Like we want you to play football. He goes, oh, I think one of them was, he goes, you're the most misunderstood mother. He goes, alive. Like he goes, people misunderstand you, all that kind of thing. So he, so he had that phone call on that, right? And then apparently what happened was, so they've made a video of this, the video of who made a video, right? And Antonio wanted it to be like a, a sort of a negative thing, but John, I think, so they showed him this video or had this recording and they've, so they've called him up and they've played it to John and whatever, and he's gone. So they, they didn't have permission to post it, right? So this is what the whole thing was. So it was on the Dan Lebertard show this morning. So he was talking about um, uh, about how they got permission to post this on Instagram, whatever, because they, they apparently you're not allowed to if you don't have John's permission because right. it's a recording, right? Yeah. So they've sent the video to John and John's just not thinking of what the context of it was. He's gone, I love that, man. Like, that's gross. Like, send it back to him. Send a text message back 15 minutes after they sent it to him. Going, I love that, Antonio. That's awesome, whatever. And they said that was the consent that they got. Uh, they agreed that then they posted this video and then the Raiders or whoever it was, that, that, that was like a part of the campaign to get him out. But then John actually thought it was just a great video <laughs> and a great recording, <laughs> but it actually helped in getting him released from the Raiders and then over to the Patriots. Yeah. But the reason they got with consent was because Gruden's come back and gone, I love that man. Like, that's awesome. That video. <laughs> and, all that. and it was actually the, the point they did it was for the opposite of that. Not for him to love it and not for him to stay at the Raiders. It it's was amazing. actually for him to leave. Yeah. It was unbelievable. It's on, if anyone listens to American podcast on the Dan Lambertard show, they talk about 
speaking with our videographer and he just tells them all. He's like, we had to get permission and that was our consent there. <laughs> and we got released. Well, it's week one and it's already crazy. I'm so pumped um, for the season starting. Pack is looking bloody good, tell you one thing. Yeah, they were actually really good the other night, weren't they? Yes. So Completely shut down Chicago. That's an awesome, yep, that's an awesome pro. Welcome back, NFL. Yeah, tell, tell us your picks for the season too, if you want, if you want to send them through. Yeah, send us out. Send us your tips, and yep. maybe I'll put a multi bet on something. Well, maybe yeah. <laughs> send us your MVP pick and your Super Bowl pick. Yes. There you go. There you go. Yeah, awesome. My con, I'm gonna, I'm chomping at the bit to talk about this. Mm-hmm. I bought, I got given as a gift by my wife tickets to the basketball, the yes. Bengals game. Yeah. Great game. They beat yeah. the US. Infamous, yes, infamous game. The first that one. is now the first game, which is you know. Seat problems. And so you missed the Russell second Crane. game. I didn't go to the first. Well, I did. I got tickets to the second. So uh, we had friends that were at the first, and during the entire game, I was getting texts from them saying, "Cancel the tickets." That like this is terrible. They couldn't see anything. They were four, uh, they were four rows from the front, mate. And you listened to it. Well, they were four rows from the front, and they couldn't see. They couldn't see anything. And and I heard it from many people. And obviously, there was there's been heaps of reports. Russell Crowe was front row, couldn't see a thing apparently with fifteen hundred dollars. Rocked up tickets. to the second game than they did the first. Yeah, no, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon they must have filled those seats. I reckon a bunch of people bailed out and they said, Look, we know it, we're gonna fill some people. Oh, I had a in. few offers for some free tickets. That yeah, I yeah. think that's what's happened. So <laughs> yeah. I didn't go to the second game and applied for a refund. Yep. Uh didn't hear back, but I said, Well, if I go you know what's going to happen. Surely you got the refund though because you didn't go. Mate, I, I chose not to go because I said, well, if I go, you, you're forfeiting your right to get a refund because you chose to go. You know what you're in for. Which is what they said pre-game. They said, if anyone doesn't come, you'll get a refund. But if you go, you can't. Well, I didn't go. And they've just emailed me back saying, no, you're not getting a refund, mate. What? Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I've cracked it. I'm, That's I'm, ridiculous. I'm off at TEG Live, who are the, who are the um, uh, I guess, the promoters of the event, are the ones giving the refund. They've done a backflip, have they, they on their own refund? On yeah. <laughs> and, and apparently they're claiming, I mean, I didn't even buy my own ticket. I got it the, gifted to me. And they're claiming that when the ticket was purchased, they hadn't announced any of the players yet. But hang on, just in saying that, your wife bought them though so it was my in the family yeah because yeah, yeah my yeah. wife when you them. say you got a gift it wasn't like someone else gave you and you're trying to claim their money no no no, 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 no. my money. wife yeah. bought them for yeah. me so i yeah. didn't purchase the tickets myself yeah. i didn't look but it was in the family but yes yeah, yeah. so I, but when she bought them she bought them you know thinking it's going to be this amazing game yes. of american basketball is all the players pulled out between then and now so that alone should give you enough for a refund they've advertised that james harden was playing up mm. until a couple of weeks before the game even though he pulled out of it yes and i the, on top of that the seating was ridiculous but from what even what you saw they were plastic ro- chairs plastic chairs from bunnings that cost twelve dollars <laughs> ninety nine. they at least could have got the black cushion ones you know the fold up like the the uh, wrestling style chairs <laughs> they whack each other would it have well helped? it's a little bit it's a cushion well and i don't understand what, what why you try to be so greedy and fill a stadium like that when you could like just pay the players to play an extra game and do them all at Rod Laver. Well, yeah, because I was going to say, like, what, what do you expect though? I mean, the NCAA tournament plays the college Final Four at an NFL stadium and they, they're on flat surface. So mm. they – and that's just part of, part of their culture. They understand that you're playing at an NFL stadium so the seats are lower than the stadium. I think it's because it's the first time it's ever happened in Australia that you're playing a basketball game in a football stadium. People didn't actually realise that there are going to be flat seats from – the stadium all the way out to the grandstand. That's it. I think if you bought tickets and said, "All right, I'm just going to go for the experience and sit in the stadium in the in the oh, like you in had the better back. seats. Yeah, and and that's fine because you know you're going to probably have to watch most of it. You're going to be far away. You're not going to be able to see much. So that's I think that's fine. Just on that though, you've been in the footy many times. Yeah. You can still see the center square. Yes, you can. Yeah, and you can still see the ball up in the middle. For sure, you can. So that you're not that far away. You're not that far away. Like you can still see the middle of the ground, yeah. which is the basketball stadium. Absolutely. So the seats are still fine anywhere you sat in the stadium. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's but except for the fact that the they they didn't they decided to raise raise up yeah, the court, which is what they need to do. They needed to, which they decided they needed to do. Why wouldn't they just raise put put other lot sort of raised areas and raise it the whole way back so that everyone was raised back as as a normal stadium would be, rather than me having to sit back in front of 400 other people who I can't see in front of now. Money. Yeah, money. Well, yeah, well, well what, you, what, if what, you're, what you're suggesting, you could have maybe, I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. Any engineers out here disagree with me, that's fine because I don't know about it. But you can maybe could have scaffolded it back until maybe the second tier of Eddie had. That's what I And I'm had the uh, flat um, sort of incline all the way up to the second level and then had the seats there all the way around. But money, that's huge cost. Oh, but, or you just get one of those, you know, those platforms that, are the, you know, uh, 12... 
inches high, yep. 30 centimeters high or whatever. And then another, and then put two on top of the next and two on top of the next until you reach a certain point where it becomes a stadium. Yeah, right. because you would have taken out the whole first row, le- the first level that he had, though. Yeah, but then you could just go up. Yeah. So what does it matter? Yeah, no, that's what I'm agree with you. Like, you yeah, could, you could yeah, have done an incri- incline, incline all the way until the second level. Yeah, yeah, and it would have been just a steady incline. But uh, that's money, purely money. Well, you can either do the scaffolding where you pay thousands and thousands of dollars to do it all the way around the stadium, three hundred sixty degrees, or you can buy five dollar chairs and bunnies. Or you could, so, <laughs> or you could just <laughs> you know pay the players a little bit more and play a third game and have three sellout games at. Rod Laver and have a spectacle and it would have been awesome and yeah. I would have definitely gone. Yeah. Um, I understand joke, that. Yeah. Joke that I have not getting a refund and I will get a refund because I'm going to fight it and well, I'm I, calling them out yeah. right now and I'm going to continue to call them out until they give me a refund. I'm very surprised by that because I did say, I remember watching the news during that first game or before that first game, they said if anyone doesn't rock up, they're going to give a refund. So if you haven't rocked up, you sh- should get a refund. I will get a refund. You will. Yeah. This is not we'll the end. We'll check back in. We'll keep T- this on. TEG Live, this is not the end. It's not the end. We're coming after you. The pros and the cons. <laughs> Lillian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I have a question we have to go straight, straight off. Okay. Straight off. So okay, I'm just going to go straight off. No worries. You, you, do you just sometimes just like you go out somewhere and you're like, I want to punch you in the face and I can <laughs> to some douchebag dude. I've always thought this, like uh, if female fighters and you're like, you, you, you know, you're a model and like I work in this industry and there's, even when we shoot, we get like guys cat calling and stuff while you're yeah. on the street and I'm shooting a model and like someone's whistles or something on the street. <laughs> Do you go out at night and go, don't even say a word. I could kick you in the head. Do you know what? I'm like the least violent person <laughs> you would find. However, I think, um, look, if someone tried to attack me, they'd probably regret it, but <laughs> I certainly would fight back. But um, yeah, look, I'm not I'm not about the violence. <laughs> but yeah, look, it crosses your mind every now and then. white line fever, that's it. Yeah, Once that's right. across that line. Yeah. Yep. Tell us a little bit about your background and your history for those people who don't know, because um, it's pretty awesome. You cover a fair few areas uh, in in your life so far. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, definitely tried a few different things. So I guess um, I started out as a lawyer. So after high school, I went to uni and did law commerce. Um, and I was modeling at the time as well, but it was more just a job to kind of support myself through uni. And then um, after uni, I did a year of modeling full time, which was really fun and loved that. And I decided um, I should probably do something with my law degree. So I ended up working at a law firm to get fully qualified and stayed there for four years in corporate law, which was a great experience, but definitely corporate lifestyle, not for me. Mm -hmm. So it was around that time that I actually started training Muay Thai, um, kind of just as a fitness activity for stress relief. And um, I'd previously done CrossFit for two years um, and I'd enjoyed that, but was looking for something a little bit different. So started training at a um a gym that was near my house i didn't even know what muay thai was at the time i just went in and said hey do you have classes and stuff i want to do something for fitness and they're like yeah we run we've got uh, muay thai classes you can come and do the ladies classes so i started out doing those and while i was training i'd watch the fighters training in the background sort of behind me and i was like yeah that looks like way more fun than what i'm doing here (laughs) so yeah, that's kind of where it all started for me with Muay Thai. So I um, continued to train pretty consistently. I met my first trainer there um, and then went on to have, you know, sparring comps, amateur fights, and then where I am today, I've had a four fights now and still enjoying it. Had you had that extreme, because, I mean, you can pick any sort of sport for a fitness release or even just running, but like you've chosen yeah. Muay Thai. Muay, Muay yeah. Thai. Have you actually, did, as a kid growing up, was there any extreme sports you loved doing with your adrenaline? Do you know, I, like no, I did ballet for ballet, like okay, eight yeah. years. Yeah, I was um, super into ballet and dance. Um, and I think though, I think CrossFit is where I ha- I'm quite competitive by nature, more so with myself rather than with other people. But I definitely like to push myself and see like results and have things to sort of test yourself against. So CrossFit kind of sparked that competitive nature. And I guess I was looking for something that had a competitive aspect to it, which um, obviously being a combat sport, it does. So what I find incredible and crazy is the pure like – polar opposites of the things that you've done. So you went yeah. from uh, being a lawyer to <laughs> you're fighting someone Muay Thai and ballet, like you just mentioned. Yeah. So what, what is it like about, and then you did some uh, health and fitness stuff in between yeah. that as well. Yep. What, what is it about like jumping from like something like law to Muay Thai and then backwards and forwards? Are you just finding the things you like in those moments? Do you think? Yeah. Look, I think um, 
law was something I sort of fell into and did like having done having gone to uni and done it um if I'd you know went back to finishing high school now I may not have gone and done law but I, I don't regret it I think um I've just had to try different things and see what works along the way. And I've decided that law is something um, I've sort of recently sort of stopped practicing law because it's something that you kind of need to give your full attention to. So right now my focus is fitness um, and the recipe stuff that I've been doing, that was just a hobby that grew into a website. Um, and I still do a little bit of that as well, which kind of ties in with the fitness stuff. So that, that's, yeah. so that's that's real food, healthy body. Yeah, real food, healthy body. So um, it's just a recipe website. They're kind of simple recipes, stuff that I make for myself at home. Um, just start sharing them. I started sharing them back in 2013, I think it was, on Instagram, and then became a website. And just I sort of dip into it when I have time, but yeah. I do enjoy it. Do you do a lot of recipes? So do you think of them yourself? Think what 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 could I make or that? Mm. Or do you do a lot of research online? Like how do you go um, about it? Yeah, so I generally develop them myself. So usually, I mean, some of the like meals and stuff is pretty basic. You yep. just kind of learn from. I've learned from my mum, my grandma, family sort of how to cook. And I used to watch um, Jamie Oliver, and Nigella Lawson yep. religiously, <laughs> <laughs> like massive nerd, having all their DVD collections. So. That's kind of how I learned how to cook and then I've just um, adapted recipes along the way to make them a little bit healthier, making them gluten-free, things like that. Um, so I, I guess I just jump in the kitchen and see if it works. If it doesn't work, then I don't share it. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's been something – what do you love making? Or what's your favourite? Um, recently I did a, a chocolate fudge cake, a vegan one. I'm oh, not okay. actually vegan myself but I do – try to eat vegan a fair bit of the time. Yep. Um, so, yeah, that came out pretty well. I was happy with that one. <laughs> oh, chocolate fudge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Please, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of these different things, you find that anything crosses over, like anything with law crosses over to fighting? Do you know what? What law's taught me is how to manage myself, like as a professional and making sure that um, – I don't get screwed over for lack of a better term. Mm. Um, just like watching, yeah, watching the way that you develop relationships and making sure that it works for both parties and also just learning how to express yourself clearly and things like that. I think it teaches you how to um, protect your rights, so to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's talk about your fighting career. So how many mm. fights have you had and have you got one up and coming? Um, so four to date, um, Potentially one in November. So yep. it's been – this year has been a little bit busy with um, modelling work and other commitments. So yep. – um, but, yeah, I'm hoping to have one end of November. So talk talk us through that. So you've gone from uh, train like training in, cl in a class and then, then you start fighting. What is it like to get in the, yeah, in the ring the first time? You know what? It's definitely like – I never intended to fight. It was like a natural progression. So you, you train in the gym, you start sparring in the gym, then you might go and do these sparring comps. So different people from different gyms go and spar each other. It's like usually a charity thing. Um, so that gives you your first little taste of something in the ring where people are watching. Um, and then from there you can go on to have an amateur fight. So I had one amateur fight back in 2016, which means – the rules in each state are different, but in, in Melbourne or Victoria, um, amateur fight just means you're wearing headgear, shin pads, elbow pads. Um, and then after that, I went on to have a professional rules fight with me, with no protective gear and had another one since then. And my last fight was October la last year in Perth, um, which was a draw. Yeah. A draw. <laughs> draw. So yep. is there a rematch? <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> how, how does this point scoring work for those who don't know? For um, so there's a few things. There's – um, kicks so punches score the lowest because they're considered like you're gloved you've got gloves on they do the least damage it usually goes by how much damage a shot would would um, generate so things like elbows score really high it's high damage mm. area um, <laughs> kicks so head kicks score higher than leg kicks it kind of goes down to the damage thing and then you've got um, clinching as well you know you can throw people to the floor although that's usually yeah, it's, it sort of depends. Then you get style points. Um, you also get points for who looks stronger. It kind of varies, to be honest. It's a quite complicated sport. And to be honest, I don't always know exactly how they're going to score it. When you play footy, yep. Dave, do you remember much of the games that you play? Because I, I know, like, I mean, I played junior sport, like nothing, anything special. But, like, you sometimes walk away from the game and – 
can't even really remember some of the yeah. moments. Do you have that? We sort of don't, don't can't think back onto those moments. I know there are a lot of guys that can't, but no, I'm, I'm someone that I'll remember a lot of things yeah. that happened during the game. Yeah. That's and what I think about it post what? game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my question was, mm. do you remember your fights? It's really interesting. So the last fight I have, I do remember quite like, like pretty much the whole thing, but fights prior to that like my first fight do not remember a single thing like afterwards I was like "Ooh, what happened I need to watch it back and I was watching it back and you sort of like uh oh, usually you're not very happy with your performance but there might be a few moments where you're like great yep that was something I trained and I managed to execute that in the fight but um I think it just depends you've got so much adrenaline so that can sometimes mean that you just don't really remember what happens yeah now with like now with being a professional and i'm a professional at one sport and it's hard enough with time and and uh preparation and training mm. so you're fighting and i'm assume there'd be a lot goes into that preparation and then yep. how do you juggle modeling as well which is a full-time career and there'd be a lot of preparation time that goes into that so how do you judge judge two things that you're being professional at right now and then be great at both of them yeah, look, it's I sort of have to pick my timing. So with fights, I can't really um, sort of agree to do a fight unless I've got a good month where I can really focus on the training and also depends on my team. So my trainer has to be available as well and, um, you know, sparring partners and things like that. So, and then obviously um, if I'm going to book a fight, I have to make sure they don't have any modelling commitments shortly afterwards Rock just in Bruce case. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. <laughs> um, I d actually my modelling agency when I had my first um, fight without the protective gear, I actually didn't tell them that I was having it. <laughs> and um, they saw my Instagram post afterwards and I was sort of saying like someone was filming me talking, I'm like, yeah, I've got a little bit of a black eye, but I think I'm all right. And then my agent called me the next day like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think about that at all? You're like, well, oh, I better not get kicked in the since, face. Since then, I have been a lot more conscious. Like, I didn't have anything booked, but it's, you know, you just have to kind of keep that in mind. If there is something coming up, it's probably not the best time to take a fight just in case something goes wrong. Um, but obviously, like, main thing that I'm focusing on when I'm in a fight is protecting my head at all times. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, yeah, regardless. Like defense, <laughs> I'm sort of like, my trainers like drummed this into me. It's like defense first if you're properly defended and then you can start to attack, then go ahead, but don't take stupid risks in a fight. Otherwise you could get cut open. So mm. what would be over the next say five years, you want to be more invested in the modeling or the fighting? I think, yeah. um, what's really inside that you just, I think, look, to, I'm not really aspiring to be a fighter, like a world champion, anything like that. It really is just a passion of mine. Yep. I would love to have more fights, but it, it does have to sit with my other commitments. So, I think plus I'm 33 now as well. So it's something that I probably, I'd love to do it for a couple more years, yep. but um, it's, I don't see myself doing it long-term. It's, it's a really tough career and there's not with Muay Thai, there's not a lot of capacity to really earn a decent living from it. Yep. So and with, in saying that though, there's a lot of people who have transitioned from that to um, mixed, mixed martial yeah. arts. Yeah. So is that like a path that you considered? Um, look, I, I don't, I, Mixed martial arts, I've got nothing against it, but it's not something that I'm passionate about. Um, I've done a bit of jiu-jitsu. I tried it once and I actually really loved it. Super technical and I'd really be keen to explore it more, but I don't see myself ever fighting um, MMA. So it's, yeah, Muay Thai is really what I love and that's the art form that I want to keep practicing. Talk us through what it's like to get in the, in the ring the first time. Yes. Well, it's, it's definitely nerve wracking. The most... My biggest fear was letting my trainer down. So going into the ring and just being embarrassing, basically mm -hmm. not being able to execute anything that I'd trained and, and feeling like I'd let my trainer down because the train your trainer invests so much time and energy into getting you ready for a fight. You really want to be able to really show that you've learned something and you've executed it. So that's usually been my biggest fear, not so much like injuries, things like that. I think, um, yeah, you, you know, you're prepared you've done hard sparring before, so you're not really scared of pain and things like that. Um, yeah, my biggest fear is usually just not performing well. But um, yeah, look, it's something that for me, my main strategy is to just go in, just pretending like it's not a big deal, just take the pressure off. Just think, you know, don't think about the people watching, don't think about the result or anything like that. Just think, you know, this is just another day at the office, just going in, a bit of sparring, see what happens. Like Kick all someone good. in the head. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what would your mindset be, say, when you're fighting? Do you want to 
knock the other person out or are you conscious of getting knocked out? Like, what do you think your mindset goes to there? Are you on the aggression or are you? It's usually about payback. Yep. So my kind of thing, and that's also goes to the scoring. So usually I should have mentioned before, like if you have an exchange, whoever gets the last shot in, in that exchange will win the point. Yep. So my thing is basically, I'm not sort of, I usually don't rush in. And I find sometimes in a few fights I've had where as soon as the bell goes, the girls just like <laughs> rush at me. I'm like, okay, that escalated quickly. Yep. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, basically if they, if they hit me, I'm going to hit them back harder and better. So yep. that's generally what I'm trying to do. I probably a bit more of a um, defensive fighter, I guess. Yes. Yep. yep. Do you watch much fighting now, especially? Yeah, look, I, I love um, Sanchai is probably my favourite fighter. He's a Thai fighter. He's amazing. He's had you know, three, 400 fights and his technical ability is just like incredible. Um, so I watch all of his fights, um, follow him on Instagram. He's a pretty <laughs> cool guy. He's pretty funny. Um, Nathan Corbett's another fighter. I like to watch. He's not um, fighting anymore, but I've watched his fights, um, past fights, and basically just um, – yeah, I, I choose which fights I watch, but I do enjoy watching Muay Thai, exclusively watching Muay Thai. I don't mind boxing, but I pretty much only watch Muay Thai, to be honest. Let's talk us through your, your modelling at the moment. What campaigns have you been a part of at the moment? Have you got anything exciting coming up? Um, so I've just done some work with Maybelline, which was pretty fun. I went over to New York and we filmed a um, – it was a campaign called Generation Fluid about people who have different roles and – my sort of story was about how I cover Muay Thai law modeling, um, that sort of concept of fluidity in today's generation. Um, yep. That was really fun um, shooting that over in New York. And I've done um, a bit of work with Champion more, more recently, which was fun. Again, like got to do some Muay Thai, a bit of video content. Um, I love when I can incorporate that kind of stuff into my work. Um, and I find that now these days, like traditional modeling stuff where you're just sort of posing for the camera, it's not as common. I love that there's more video now and they want to see action. They want to see, you know, um, aspects of my Muay Thai as part of the shoot, which is something that I love doing. So, Would you feel yeah. in the future you'd set up a, um, a kind of a training centre where you can do fitness modelling, that kind of thing for people who are aspiring to do it? Because I'm sure you probably get yeah. a lot of people asking on Instagram about how to get into that industry and yeah, how to combine look, the two. I actually love teaching. So to teach Muay Thai is something that I want to um, pick up again. Um and yeah, I'd love to be able to really explore that a little bit more and, and potentially have some sort of place for people to come and learn yep. further down the track. Um, a few training camps over in overseas. Yeah, in Thailand. yeah. Well, the training camps in Thailand are great because yeah. you just get to go there and completely um, forget about the rest of the world and just focus on your training. Um, I love that. I've typically gone every year, although this year I haven't been yet, so I might have to try and fit that in later. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's the birthplace of Muay Thai. So what is it, yeah. what is it like to, to go over there um, and and especially as a professional to train there? The, you know, tell us a bit about that in, in terms of their lifestyle and the culture. And, and yeah, all. well, Muay Thai is it's the Thailand's national sport. It's like mm. AFL for Australia, basically. Everyone loves it. Like the best thing about when you go and train at the gyms, um, you know, if you're doing your sort of warm up run around the town in your tie shorts, everyone's like, yeah, boxing, boxing, <laughs> <laughs> like cheering you on and everything. Um, <laughs> it's very dependent on where you go. I've found, I've been to a few different places. Um, in Bangkok and a smaller town called Hua Hin and also Phuket. Um, the more commercial gyms like Tiger in Phuket are great if you just want to go and really um, work on your fitness and train hard in sort of a fun environment where there's lots of people from all over the world. However, if you really want to learn proper technique and have trainers who care a little bit more about actually teaching and sharing their knowledge, you're better off going to smaller gyms, which are usually located in smaller towns a little bit more um, under the radar. So that's Typically what, what I'll try to find is a gym that's going to give me uh, where I can basically learn because um, there's just so much knowledge there. Yeah, the culture is crazy. Don't they, yeah. don't they um, start real young as well? Yeah. Some of these kids are kicking yeah. trees and stuff when they're like <laughs> – Yeah, they <laughs> have – um, <laughs> That was true. That's yeah. what they do. Logs and – They yeah, do. Logs down with their legs. Shin conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, look, that's the thing with um, – Yeah, a lot of Thai fighters because they've been fighting since they were really young, their shins are – like metal poles because they're so conditioned um and it is a way for them to make money as well so in the smaller towns there's local fights every week like at least three or four times a week where 
um, all the local fighters will fight for money and they also have gambling, um, betting on the fights there as well, which is a bit of a money maker. Mm. So um, I don't think you're allowed to do that in Australia. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's definitely a big part of their life. And then you get a lot of people over there just also train it as a fitness activity who, who don't necessarily fight. Um, but then, you know, sometimes, you know, the local cab driver will jump into one of the local fights <laughs> <laughs> and be amazing. So right. Yeah, right. So speaking of shin conditioning and that mm. those kids have been doing it since they were, since they yeah. were young, uh, did you find that you had to condition your body to be able to fight and then have you had many injuries during the sport? Yeah, so my um, shins definitely were not conditioned when I first started. Like yeah. even just things like kicking the heavy bags, kicking the pads, if you you know get the edge of the pad, you I'll, I was bruised, just constantly bruised in my shins. Same if you've had a little break from training and then you go back to it, you'll start bruising again. But um, now I think, you know, it's been almost seven years now. I feel like my shins, I don't, they don't bruise up anymore. Um, in a fight though, you'll – if you happen to check a kick, so blocking a kick with your shin, it's like shin on shin, yep. you, you'll get a decent bruise yeah, from that. <laughs> but um, yeah. And look, thankfully no breakage of my shin or I haven't had, haven't had any broken bones, just yep. bruising basically. Have you seen a shin snap in a fight? I haven't. I've seen video of it. Like yep. it's uh, people like oh, there's like a – quads being split in half like oh, from a leg nasty. kick oh. it can be it can be pretty brutal, brutal. Yeah. um yeah, yeah but you do that's one of the things you have to think about if you're going to start fighting without the protective gear you've got to think about the conditioning of your shins and typically like it's really just it gets conditioned during the training process kicking the heavy bag kicking the pads making sure that you're and sparring as well like my trainer has been fighting since he was nine. So his shins are pretty hard. So even when he kicks me and I check it, even with shin guards, I'll sometimes get a breeze from it. <laughs> yeah, it's a super male dominated sport, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? And, and in Thailand even more, is there a lot of female fighters in um, Thailand? Or is do you it- know that there are actually, and the girls are tough. They're mm. good fighters. Um, it's, I think something I'm really passionate about is getting more women interested in the sport because it is such a male dominated sport in Australia. Um, and it can be very intimidating to get into it because there's not really that many commercial gyms offering Muay Thai. It's like we're seeing a lot of commercial boxing gyms pop up. But if you want to do Muay Thai, you kind of have to just go to a fighter's gym, which can be quite an intimidating mm-hmm. environment. So I would love to be able to um, provide like a training space for girls to come and learn in a like less intimidating environment because it's such a positive sport for it's like self-confidence, even just things like self-defense. It just gives you that um, – fight back instinct Mm -hmm. i think which is really important Uh, and what about just going over there as an australian model being like hey i'm i'm a professional training to be a muay thai fighter (laughs) what do they how do they take that um oh they they think it's pretty funny (laughs) (laughs) um yeah like they've got such the thai people have such a good sense of humor so you just have a laugh really (laughs) I watched a video of yours um, uh, where it was, must have been a trainer over there in, yep. in Bangkok, I think. And yeah, he was that, calling you the supermodel. Yeah, that was top. <laughs> he's, he's, he's the best. Um, he, yeah, he was having a joke. He's like, oh, training supermodel today. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> cool. All right. <laughs> now, speaking of training and hard enough that you've got to deal with a person fighting you across the room or across the, uh, the floor, You've had a training mishap with wild dogs. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. <laughs> it's hard <laughs> so enough to t- train. Today, <laughs> today I'm wearing the pants that expose my scar um, <laughs> on the knee. Yeah, yeah I was in. Um, it was actually my f- second trip to Thailand. I was in a small town called Hua Hin. Um, it's about three hours of away from Bangkok, um, and the gym. You know, you sort of do your warm up run around the block on the road, and there's it's sort of you know, there's just these like patches of land that there's no housing or anything. So there's these packs of wild dogs that live (laughs) around and the locals kind of feed them. And so they survive, but they're, they're pretty, pretty wild. Um, And usually they don't bother anyone. Like sometimes um, you'll do your warm up run with other fighters and sometimes you'll take a stick with you or rocks so that if they start to kind of run at you, you can kind of throw a rock, just not necessarily at them, but yeah. try and like scare them away. Yep. But um, I was literally just about a hundred meters away from the gym. I had my headphones in, just started my warm up run thinking, yeah, this is going to be a good day. And then um, the, basically the pack of dogs started barking and they ran at me. <laughs> so I sort of freaked out. It turned yep. out they were probably just um, wanting to play or something, but I, I kind of like freaked out a little bit, tried to dodge them, ended up tripping over one of them, um, landed on my knee, big chunk of my knee came out. 
into the gravel, um, <laughs> rolled nasty. and like shredded my back and my elbow. And um, thankfully they didn't bite me or anything. They literally just ran off. But yeah. um yeah, it was pretty bad. I like stood up. I remember looking down at my knee and it's like blood. My whole shin was like red and I didn't feel anything at the time. I just looked at it and I'm like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> and then I was actually too scared to walk back to the gym because that, that's where the dogs were. So I started just walking and this guy came on a motorbike and saw like I had my like Muay Thai shorts on. So yep. he's like, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? And he like gave me a lift back to the gym and they cleaned out my knee and um, yeah, two days later it was infected, so I had to fly home. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> Did you need stitches or? Well, because it was literally like a 50 cent piece chunk size oh. out of my knee, oh. you can't stitch anything together. So it was like every three days I had to go back to the doctor to get it redressed. I had to keep it out of water, keep it dry. And it was just a painful process of waiting for it to slowly close over. And then, so I couldn't train, couldn't really do anything um so frustrating like go to, go to train for Muay Thai and the dogs get you yeah, <laughs> yeah I know it's to date my worst it's injury is, is, oh. is that so is it in terms of fighting um if some average guy or girl let's say guy because I think that's fun uh gets in the ring with you no yep. experience what happens to them I mean, I'm part yeah. the obvious. <laughs> Getting the shit. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, usually the first things that will happen is the adrenaline will kick in, the hands will come down, and they'll start swimming. Like, yeah. just <laughs> it's <laughs> happened to everyone. <laughs> it's happened to us all. Yeah, kind of just um, letting getting too emotional. I think that's the biggest thing that happens with um, when you're starting out is that you you let your sort of emotions get in the way and you start to make silly choices in the ring. Whereas um, yeah, you just really want to stay composed. You want to stay calm. You want to actually look for openings or create openings that you can actually score a point. Um, yeah, that's kind of what you learn. As, as you get more ring experience, you become more comfortable in the ring and less. Um, you get less of that sort of adrenaline, like psycho kind of yeah. rush. <laughs> yeah. And because <laughs> I guess like the striking side of it, I feel like, I don't know, maybe it's just Australia, but uh, striking in in general is probably more thought of to be a punch, but, but yeah. you guys would be very much more uh, trying to kick all the time, which yeah. is crazy. Cause it's like the flexibility and the strength that you need in your legs and all that sort of stuff. So do you find that that's like the difference in terms of what you have to learn the most? Yeah, definitely. So in Muay Thai, we use punches more so to set up shots. So you'll use a punch to either block their vision. It might even just be kind of throwing the hand into their face so that you can distract them and then do a leg kick or a body kick. Mm. Um, and also the other thing with Muay Thai, because you've got the stand up, the clinching, so stand up grappling, like if someone's like trying to punch you, you can just lock onto their head and then they can't punch you anymore. And then it becomes an elbow fight basically. Um, but yeah, look with kicking, it is very much, um, you just got to get the right mechanics for it. Otherwise you've got, you won't have any power. So it's a lot of Muay Thai is also learning proper kicking technique um, so that you can generate power without too much effort. Mm. What's yeah. the most brutal thing that you've seen? Oh, elbows for sure. Like just when people, mm. if you land an elbow, it, it cuts you open like yeah. straight away. Um, <laughs> seeing people with like, it, it, it'll like their eyebrows like hanging off or their lip, um, their <laughs> lips hanging like a chunk of their lips come out because it's just been split open. Yeah. That's probably the worst I've seen. So do you think that there's, because of the violence of it, and I, I think uh, MMA, Uf, UFC in particular mm. uh, is the... I guess been the catalyst of change here. We weren't even allowed to fight in the octagon yeah. or in a cage before they uh, released that. It was only a few years ago. Um, do you think that there's been a change in terms of like the understanding of the sport and then also the violent side is kind of pushed aside a little bit more for the, uh, I guess, looking at it as, a, as an amazing skill now, skilled sport? Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, it's two adults consenting to mm. the risks. So it's it's like... You, you can kind of appreciate it. You can appreciate the technical um, aspects if you, yeah, just remember that, you know, it's not like a situation where someone's being unfairly taken advantage of. Mm. Um, and, yeah, look, and that's part of my reason for not wanting to go into MMA is because I personally don't feel – like I would be able to sit on top of someone and just like pummel them with elbows. And I certainly wouldn't want them to do that to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, it's one of those things. I think, um, you know, you can appreciate the technical aspects as long as it's all done fairly and safely. Well, as safely as you can mm, really. Absolutely. Yeah. So October's the 
say October is the November. next fight. The end of November, November. End of November, the next fight. Yeah. So training camp potentially starting soon. Is that yeah? That so um, just getting back into the regular schedule of training. Um, well, yeah, I've got to go after this actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so getting back into my training, getting back into I have to start sparring again and um, starting to commit my time. So is this where the modelling goes on hold now for Yeah, a like it's, it's fine while you're training. It's more yeah. just um, once the fight's confirmed, then I need to make sure that I've got a decent few weeks afterwards yep. of nothing um, just in case. Yep. yep. We're going to have to tune in. Do you, can we watch it? Is there a way to watch it? You don't um, know where it's going to be usually, yet? Usually they're live streamed, but yeah, look, it's not confirmed yet, but um, mm. I'll obviously share details. But yeah, Definitely. typically live streamed. Yeah, can awesome. watch it online. Amazing. Awesome. Well, Thank you so much for joining us. It's been awesome. Thank to Thanks chat. for having me. Might have to get in the ring. Maybe not you, Dave. I think I might not allow that. <laughs> not me, right? no. Maybe not after <laughs> your ankle surgery. Yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> Let that heal. My agent will be calling. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> how, how's that going to go down with the club? Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but good luck, though. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. Thanks for watching another episode, guys. We hope you enjoyed it. It was a great one from our point of view. Make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube, guys. Make sure you don't miss an episode whenever they drop. And if you want to listen on any of your podcast devices, Apple or Spotify, make sure you subscribe to that and give us five-star review and leave us a comment. See you next time.